Hello, all my friends. My name is Joel Martin. I'm pastor uh, in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. Right now, I'm serving a church in Hawaii on the island of Maui uh, called Kihei Lutheran Church. And I've been here for about five years, loving it. This place is amazing. Uh, what a place to heal. Um, I've, been a I've been a pastor for close to 20 years. I was ordained in 2003. And um, I have a story that I want to share with you. I'm really excited that uh, Lutheran Women Mission invited me to speak. Um, I'm also a bit hesitant because of the story that I want to share with you is, is currently happening. Um, it's like in process, it's, it's, it's active. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's a rough one for me, um, but also good in a lot of ways. Yeah, let's see, let's get right into it. In, um, in November of 2021, um, on my birthday, actually, I received a, uh, I, re I received a notification that I had a, uh, doctors had found a very large tumor on my right kidney and they thought that it was possibly cancerous. Um, and this shocked, really shocked me. Um, everything went really fast. As you can imagine, I was just kind of like, sh and absolutely um, filled with despair and not knowing what to do uh, or how to hold this or how to contain this or um, how, how this was gonna end up. Um, so I, I, I had surgery. They took the, the tumor out it, 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 and my kidney. They couldn't do it laparoscopically, so they had to actually go in manually. And they cut me from about here to about there. And they took the, uh, the tumor and my right kidney out and uh, then they filled me up with this solution that kills cancer cells and then they uh, they wiped everything down and scrubbed me clean and then they sewed me back up. So I was in the hospital for about six days and um, during that time I was, I was on heavy medications. So for like four weeks leading up to the surgery they had me on oxycodone to help with the pain that I was experiencing and then in the hospital they had me on fentanyl and oxycodone and then after that um, they had me on oxycodone and without it I don't know what I would have done because the pain was excruciating. So I came home and I recovered and recovery went really well. I recovered physically pretty quickly but mentally and emotionally I was in it. I was I didn't know I, I was kind of plunged into this existential crisis right and uh, as I was in that place I was really wondering about like who I am, what identity, who, who am I? What am I? I'm not the same person as I was before. I'm not the Joel I was just a couple months ago. That Joel was a person who was tired and you know, um, he carried a lot of trauma and he carried a lot of grievance uh, of harm done to him by others in the past. And, and he carried a lot of um, frustration and, you know, just things that really uh, didn't serve him, didn't serve me. It was it, it, things that really lent to my illness, honestly. My wife likes to jokingly call me a sin eater. And I didn't think much of it until this happened. What she meant was that I'm one of those people who can't help uh, myself. I can't help myself, but help people and love people and take on their burdens, take on their stress, take on whatever they have done in their life and um, so they don't have to carry it themselves. And I would do that and I would take that and I would store it within myself. I thought I was, I thought I had uh, let it go, you know, given it to God so that I was kind of this pass through thing, but really I wasn't, I was holding on to these, to these burdens. So receiving this diagnosis kind of threw me way off. I was put on disability. Um, I had to take a leave of absence for however long. In fact, I just came back to work last week. Sunday, the first Sunday of March was my first Sunday back. Um, and it was interesting that the text for that Sunday was Luke, uh, when Jesus was, was from Luke, when Jesus was, um, pushed into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit right after his baptism where he was tempted. It made me think about my own wilderness journey that I've been on over the past number of weeks. 
Someone asked me what the hardest part of that uh, of this experience has been so far. And it, it was not the receiving the diagnosis that was horrible. It wasn't um, finding out that I had cancer. Most difficult part of this whole experience was a week after I stopped um, taking my pain medicine. That's when the real, the real wilderness journey began. That was me being pushed into the wilderness because I did not expect what was going to happen. I had been on um, opioids for at this point by three months for three months and suddenly not having those opioids in my system caused me to go into withdrawals I was experiencing these weird brain shivers like brain zaps um, and I'm still I still am today um, occasionally I experienced my nervous system like uh, having an earthquake inside of my body. I was shaking and I couldn't stop. I couldn't con control it. I couldn't contain it. Uh, my calves were twitching, mi micro twitches that were driving me insane. I had these panic attacks where uh, it wasn't just like general anxiety, but it was like, oh, the world is going to end where all of the blood leaves your hands and your feet and your extremities and goes to your core because you're in a, a life or death situation. I was having panic attacks like that. I was having diarrhea, I was having um, all of these really, my heart rate was way up um, and everything was feeling, I was feeling like I was out of control and I didn't know what was going on. And one day I was like, you know what, these brain zaps are crazy, I'm going to the, go to the chiropractor and, and have him adjust me and maybe that will get rid of it, maybe it's just like a pinched nerve or something. And the doctor did that and uh, it didn't get rid of it and I drove home from the chiropractor, it took 20 minutes. And when I got home, I told my wife that I was dying. I had convinced myself, <laughs> I had convinced myself that the cancer had gone to my brain. And that within who knows how many weeks I was most likely gonna be dying. I told her, I sat her down, I said, I'm, I, I, it's not going away, something's really wrong. Most likely it's in my head, in my brain and it's gonna go quick. We need to talk about this because I need you to know how much, how much you mean to me and how much I love you and how much the kids, how much I love them. I need you guys to know this. And she sat down, she was already sitting down, but she, she kind of entered into that conversation and she said, okay, let's, let's talk this through. And we did, we talked and she was fantastic. And she said, you're, you are having withdrawals from the opioids. You don't have brain cancer. And I said, no, I haven't, I'm not having withdrawals. I know what those are like. Um, and this is not that, this is not that. And she said, well, I'll be right back. She got up and she left. She came back into the room and she had a pain pill. And she said, I want you to take this and let's see what happens. And within 15 minutes, all of the symptoms were gone. I was no longer shaking. My heart rate leveled out. My brain zaps went away. The panic was gone. The anxiety was gone. Everything went away and I felt great. Felt better than I had in a week. I was having withdrawals. That's when my this wilderness experience started for me. When Jesus was in the wilderness, he was tempted, right? That's the story that we know. Jesus got driven out by the Holy Spirit after his baptism into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days. It says that he was really hungry, he was famished and, and really tired. It also says that this entity, the devil, um, entered into the scene and would tempt Jesus as he was weak. Tempted him to turn a rock to bread, tempted him to bow down and worship him, he would rule the world, tempted Jesus to throw himself off of the pinnacle of the temple because uh, the Bible says that the angels would never let him fall. This story has uh, a lot of significance for me. The wilderness experience can be a, a mental and emotional and spiritual and physical and, um, <clears throat> and psychological and um, everything that we, that we experience in our life. So we see Jesus, he's there, he's in the wilderness. 
And we know Jesus is 100% human and 100% God, right? And so we see in the story, Jesus is struggling with his humanity. Okay, he's struggling with his humanity and his uh, reconciling his humanity with his divinity. So I talked on Sunday um, after experiencing what I've experienced. I have this whole new outlook on this passage. Um, and, you know, bear with me, but I like to challenge my people and I like to think things in a different, see things in a different way. And so I, I, I asked the question, what if Jesus was um, struggling with his, within his mind? What if these temptations were really not necessarily coming from another entity, the devil, but rather coming from himself, his ego? Because that's that human side of him, right? Every, all of us, we have this ego that we struggle with. It talks to us and it, it, it whispers lies and it tells us that we're doing things wrong and it's struggling for identity and it's looking for ways to control us and it's constantly there, constantly spinning these stories, constantly causing chaos. And it's even protecting us from harmful things in life. This is the beginning of his ministry. So what if Jesus is trying to figure this out within him, trying to balance out the humanity with the divine. And he says, it says in there in the passage that he's hungry, <laughs> really hungry. And I've been hungry. I've been really, really hungry at times. I don't know if you have, but if you have, you'll understand this, that if you could, if you could turn a rock into a loaf of bread and fill up your belly, you'd do it, right? I would. I wouldn't hesitate. I'd be like, oh yeah, I have these divine powers. I'm gonna turn this rock into bread and I'm gonna eat that bread and I'm gonna make that rock into another piece of bread and I'm gonna eat that bread. And Jesus is struggling, he's thinking about that. He's like, man, I could really do that, but should I? Should I do it? What are the consequences of me misusing my divinity just for a piece of bread? What's the fallout gonna be? That's the temptation. And Jesus remembers that we don't live by bread alone, but by the word of God. You know, there was times in my journey, these past number of weeks, where I thought to myself that it would be so much easier if I just ended it. Make it so much easier. I wouldn't have to experience all of this torture in my body and in my mind and in my heart. All of the what ifs. So I told my wife that because I knew I recognized it. And I told her I was having these thoughts and these feelings and I talked with my therapist about it and obviously didn't act on it and won't. Because if I did act on that, the consequences are profound. So I was thinking about Jesus and, and him being within his struggle in the wilderness. And you know, maybe he thought, you know, I could just jump off of that pinnacle of the temple and it'd all be done. I wouldn't have to do any of this. But we know that the ultimate fallout for that, right? It's true. And, and, and maybe in this balancing out of Jesus' divinity with his humanity, he saw, oh man, I could rule the world. I have the power that I could, I could take over everything and I could be the ruler of this world. That's a temptation. He, I'm sure he struggled with that. I'm sure he, he wrestled with that. And finally, ultimately, after weighing the cost, he said, no, no. Worship, I worship the Lord my God and only God. The struggle is real. The struggle is hard. The main withdrawal symptoms for me ended about eight days ago. And the first day that the brain skips went away and everything chilled out in my body, I was so grateful and I'm so thankful but those those weeks the four weeks where I was in it were the hardest weeks of my life but it turned me into a different person I was able to see myself and see life and see the world through really a different eyes a whole different mindset. I want to invite you into this. 
There's going to be times in our life where we are pushed into the wilderness by the Spirit, or we are shoved into the wilderness by life. Um, but there's also times where we can enter into the wilderness um, purposefully. Uh, Carl Jung, the psycho, uh, psychoanalyst um, from mid-century, he talks about um, this kind of process that he liked to call shadow work. It's really um, looking at your issues and struggling with your ego and, and coming to a place of um, finality with whatever those issues might be so that those issues no longer bother you. I know that being a man, we men tend to push and suppress our emotions, right? We tend to push them down so we don't have to deal with it um, because there's so much and because society tells us that we're, that's what we're supposed to do. To be a man shouldn't have these things affect you. But I, I think differently. I think, um, I, I, I agree with Carl Jung. I, and I think that Jesus' example of this is, is very telling, that we are supposed to go inward. I mean, isn't that what the Lenten season is about? Looking inward and finding those faults that you have and uh, repenting of those so that when we come to Easter, you know, that new resurrection life is, is, is profound. You can't see that light without the dark. In the wilderness is that dark time. It's that hard, that difficult time that we struggle with our ego. We struggle with ourselves so that we can come out as better people. So this whole shadow work idea, here's an example of it. Um, the other day I had this moment where I was, I saw a person and I judged them Instantly, I judge this person because that person looks strange. Yeah, that person looks strange to me and I didn't understand what they were doing and I caught myself. I was aware and I said, why? Why did I just judge that person? There's no reason for me to judge that person. I don't know that person. And I had a realization and it wasn't them who I was judging. It was some aspect of myself that I projected onto that person that I was judging. So really I was judging myself. And then Jesus say, judge not lest you be judged, right? That's what he's talking about. We project all of our issues on everyone around us. The, all those things that we've suppressed over our lifetime, we project all of that out on the people around us and it causes strife and chaos and broken relationships and it causes um, illness and strife and everything gets stuffed down and it eventually will come out one way or another. The healthy way is to deal with it. The godly way is to deal with it. So I saw that person, I real, had that realization that I was judging myself and I wanted to know what it was that I was projecting onto that person. And so I went into this, uh, did this little exercise where I kind of asked myself different questions, trying to find out what it was. And it led me on this trail, this journey all the way to where I was in first grade. When I was in first grade, my teacher told me to stand up in front of my class. And so I did. And said to me, Joel, XYPDQ. And I had no idea what she was talking about. XYPDQ? What? I don't know what that is. What do you mean? And all the other kids were laughing at me and having a good old time. And, and she was laughing and she said, Joel, examine your zipper pretty darn quick. And I looked down and my zipper was open and I was mortified. I was embarrassed. I was hurt. I was taken aback. I didn't want to be there. And I took that experience and I shoved it away. I looked weird in front of all of my peers. That's what I'm talking about when I say shadow work. When I say looking at those issues that we have all suppressed because we, we start to, if we don't deal with it, we begin to put it on other people. And that's what causes the chaos in our lives. That's what causes the chaos in our churches. That's what causes the chaos in our schools and in our governments and, and everything. That's what causes it all. 
The place to begin is within. I want to invite you to take that journey into the wilderness. We're all going to have different wilderness experiences and all of our wilderness experiences are going to make us grow. We're going to grow spiritually. We're going to grow physically. We're going to grow emotionally. We're going to grow spiritually. And our faith is ultimately going to grow. Our relationships will begin to be healed. Our bodies will start to become healthier. Because when we can do that, finally, we're able to live out the call of Jesus on our lives, which is to love one another, right? Not to judge each other, to love one another. And to ulti ultimately, to be able to do that, you have to be able to love yourself. You have to look deep in your heart and you have to forgive those things that have happened to you. You have to put love on those things that happened to you, that hurt you, that dragged you down. You have to love that and bring it out into the light. Are you willing to take that plunge? Are you willing to take that journey? It's a lot easier if you choose to do it. It's a lot more difficult if you get pushed into it. At least that's what I'm experiencing. I want to thank you for letting me speak. I want to thank you for taking the time to, to hear me, to listen to me. I hope you take me up on my invitation. I hope you take the time to, del to, to dig deep because I know that you will be a better person for it. And so I want to leave you with this short little prayer. Gracious God, I thank you for all of these men for all of their gifts, for all of their love, for their forgiveness, for their joy in you. I ask, Lord, that you would enable them to dig deep, enable them to really take a hard look at themselves to see what are those issues that they need to bring to the light. I thank you for their love, for their joy. And I ask that you would lead and guide each and every one of them. We pray this in your name. Amen.